Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Sizemore. And I'm Gunnar Sizemore. Welcome to The Miracle Show. Now we get a chance to meet a man by the name of Andrew Jones. Andrew was one of the countless people waiting for an organ transplant. And being an organ donor actually saved over 12,000 lives in this country. Dude, how, how'd you know that? I do go to high school. Okay, let's go live to Andrew right now. Andrew. Hey Kevin, what's going on? Hey man, not a whole lot. Just hanging out with my son Gunner here. Can you tell us what your life was like before everything happened? Um, I lived a life that was um, pretty normal on the surface. I did a lot of athletics in high school and continued my own type of uh, weightlifting program in college. So I'm very familiar with uh, different signs my body is showing me. Um, and thankfully I was able to uh, recognize when something was different. And what was different? So I was about uh, 22 years old when I was, uh, I went out on a run um, right out here in my front yard and just as I'm passing my mailbox, I feel as if my lungs had, it, it, feel, it felt as if I needed to have a concerted effort to breathe. I, I turned right around and um, called my physician and saw him the very next day. And then he broke the news that, um, you know, I had this heart anomaly. And of course, at the time it wasn't, it didn't raise too much concern. So I understand that after using a heart monitor for 24 hours, you're referred to a cardiologist. What did they tell you? My cardiologist informed me that I had this viral myocarditis and that at this stage, it wasn't anything to you know become concerned about, but I'll never forget how he said that usually people with this kind of condition, um, it's not uncommon for people with this condition to later on need advanced therapies such as a heart transplant. I did notice that my, my symptoms from this heart disease were beginning to become more advanced and a little bit more aggressive. So I found myself going in and out of the ER, um, having episodes where I'm not able to breathe, where I'm coughing. And tell us about your eventual diagnosis. I don't remember the, the, the exact moment I was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, but I do remember when I started hearing that term more and more, um, this was around the time where I was implanted with um, an ICD or pacemaker or that device was supposed to protect me from these irregular heart rhythms because um, I'm now at a stage where my heart could fall into, you know, AFib or some type of tachycardia that would uh, put me into cardiac arrest. Well, that is incredibly frightening to hear, especially your age. But things, they got worse, didn't they? Turns out that um, in the last couple of days, I had congestive heart failure. And he said, um, well, at this point, you know, we, there's not much else we can do besides put you on the list for a heart transplant. Hearing that I needed a heart transplant, I heard we're going to take the old heart out and put in a better, stronger heart. That really kind of floored me was hearing that my condition was at a point to where I was slowing down, you know, more and more and eventually I would get to a point where I would fall asleep and just not wake up. Wow, yeah. Um, how long did you have to wait for a transplant? Uh, close to a year and a half. And that combines the time I was in the hospital four months to the time I spent out of the hospital with my LVAD device that was helping me uh, make it to transplant. That was a year and one month. And then one day, what? Everything changes? Uh, but once I was able to, once I got that phone call saying that there was a heart available for me, I mean, you know, that was, you know, that, that was, I did it. Every organ transplant has a donor and a recipient, and a heart transplant calls for that donor to pass on. Now herein lies the true miracle, because that's what an organ transplant is, a miracle, letting tragedy give way to a life renewed. Joining us to speak on Andrew's donor, Donald Smith, is Rosemary Smith. Hi, Gunner. My name is Rosemary Smith. I'm Donald Smith's mother. Welcome to the show, Rosemary. Would you like to tell us about your son? Donald was a very kind and considerate person. He was a hard worker. He was big into physical fitness. 
uh, he was very muscular because of working out. He went every day. He made it a point to work out, but he was also a grease monkey. He loved tinkering with machinery. And he talked you into letting him get a motorcycle? Donald was the type of person, he was in his 30s at the time. He didn't need my permission to get a motorcycle, but he wanted, he wanted my approval that it was okay and that I would be comfortable with it. Well, he waited a year for, to wear me down and I finally said fine. But he took the safety courses, he bought a brand new motorcycle and it was a nice quiet motorcycle and I go out in the garage one night and he's tearing this thing apart. And I said to him, Donald, what are you doing? It's new. And he was removing packing and putting another exhaust system on it. And it honestly was enough to wake the dead out in the garage. If you could have heard the noise coming from this thing. And he says to me, he says, mom, he says, people are going to hear me coming. He wasn't doing it for the thrill of it. He was doing it for safety reasons. He wore the boots, he had top of the line helmet. I figured he knows what he's doing and he's okay and he'll be safe. But I was wrong. Can you tell us about his accident? Uh, Donald, like I said, was a big family person and he loved football and we're big Pittsburgh Steelers fans. And he was on his way home uh, to watch a football game with us. And 10 minutes before the game started, I told my husband, I says, I guess Donald decided to stay over Alicia's house, his girlfriend, um, and skip the game today. And I no sooner said that, his, my husband's cell phone rings. And it was a social worker from Hartford Hospital and she asked my husband if we have a son. And Gary said, yes, we have two. And she says, do you have a son that rides a motorcycle? And she proceeded to tell us that she had Donald's cell phone and she found dad on the contacts. And that she believes that our son was at Hartford Hospital and that he was in very serious critical condition. And so we went to Hartford Hospital right away and they were still trying to stabilize him. And we were told that he had non-sustainable injuries and that he wasn't going to survive. But they were able to um, get him where we would be able to see him. So we were taken up to his room at ICU. His equipment did a fantastic job protecting his body. However, the back of his head, he had multiple skull fractures. And so we stayed with him. I'm so sorry. After the accident, Donald was kept alive by life support machines. However, all reflex tests were negative. Rosemary, if this isn't too painful, what happened next? I begged them to give us more time to, for him to heal. So then they took him down for a nuclear test to see if there was blood flow into the brain. And there was not. And then that's when they approached us and said about harvesting his organs. Gary and I were both aware that he was an organ donor. Again, that was, that's just the way Donald is. He always joked, if I'm not going to be here and someone else can benefit from the organs. Um, it's actually something that we've discussed. And my husband and I are also on the organ donor list, so it wasn't surprising. And Andrew, it was at this point when you received a life-changing phone call. I was just about, I was getting ready to head to the gym for you know another normal workout and uh, my phone rings and I recognize the number immediately. It's the hospital. The nurse on the other end uh, asked me, you know, how I was feeling and I said, I'm, I'm feeling fine. Thank you for asking. And they asked me, well, would you say you're feeling on top of the world? And I was like, I wouldn't say that. It's another regular day for me. And they said, well, 
I don't think so. I, you know, I think that um, we might have a heart for you. I recall my surgeon telling me after my transplant, um, when I met him, that my name had come up um, as a recipient for other hearts, but, and he said that we're definitely looking for the best heart we could find. And um, I would say they definitely found it. So did they tell you anything about your heart donor? Uh, Donald, he was, you know, he was a white man and he was a couple years older than me. But the point is, uh, you know, we've all heard the term, we all bleed red. Um, and it's even, it's just more than that. It's more than just, oh, we all bleed red. We're all the same on the inside. It's also our capabilities for helping each other. I'm only alive here telling you this story because, well, someone graciously said I could. I and mean, they said yes to my life. Andrew. After the surgery, you have the option to meet the donor family. Is that correct? So it really starts as an option to uh, be able to meet your donor family or the donor family to meet the recipient. And for me, it was an automatic yes. I wanted, be, I wanted to be able to say thank you. I even began drafting letters uh, from my hospital room after my transplant. And as I understand it, you drafted many letters and you just couldn't find the words. But one day, things changed. Actually, it was three years to the day of my heart transplant. So September 21st, 2019 was when I met my donor family. Again, you, it's not like you're there with a planned script or you've done this before. You're simply going to meet someone who you've never met before, um, whose loved one um, is no longer with them. I was very excited about meeting Andrew, but when we arrived, I became very nervous extremely nervous. We arrived first, and Andrew's family arrived shortly after us. And when they walked in, they embraced us. They gave us, you know, a big hug. Um, he was there with his parents and his one brother. And it was like we knew each other forever. We had a great conversation. Um, we learned a lot about ourselves. It turns out that Donald's dad and my dad um, worked for the same company and undoubtedly crossed paths. Ah, but you had one last gift for Rosemary. So I was able to, when we gave her a stethoscope and she was able to listen to Donald's heart. I was very excited um, and overwhelmed. And when I heard it for the first time, it was wonderful and to realize that that was my son's heart and to see that miracle of what Donald's donation actually did. It actually saved a life. And that was the first time I felt happy after my son passing. It's just like the light switch went off. It was closure for me. And I can honestly say that that was the turning point of uh, accepting the accident and being able to move forward. And I feel that Andrew is a member of the family. I think one of the biggest lessons to learn from a, you know, a meeting like this is that the world is small and that life is short and fragile. Rosemary, is there anything you'd like to say to Andrew? Andrew, I love you like a son. He refers to me as his donor mom. He also, for Mother's Day, posted a picture of me and his mother side by side and wishing us happy Mother's Day. Um, I hope you continue to stay healthy and do well, and I look forward to meeting you again. Rosemary, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. Gunnar, thank you very much for having me on the show. It was a pleasure telling you about my son. It's a shame Donald's no longer with us, but I guess he kind of still is, you know, through Andrew. Many people view movies as more than entertainment. For some, they're lifelong passions and it connects people no matter what the circumstances are. Meet Mark Orsillo. He had this kind of passion and took great pride in his meticulously curated movie collection. However, when a wildfire decimated his collection, Mark and his sister turned the resulting moment of community outreach into a profound act of paying it forward. So let's go to California right now and meet Danielle. Hey, Danielle, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Kevin, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having us on the show. 
Hey, you're welcome. Nice to meet you too. Can you tell us a little bit about your brother, Mark? Mark is one of the most remarkable human beings I've ever met in my life. He's one of four kids, and so, uh, and my older brother. My parents were always really honest with Mark about him having Down syndrome, and and so when he became adult, my parents just kept that going. I mean, he's a lifelong learner. So they, my dad's a contractor. They built him his own little apartment that's attached to their house. Uh, actually, also works at a candy store. We hear he's a pretty big deal in town, huh? <laughs> Mark is like Orville's mascot. I mean, everybody knows Mark. So let's hop right into the story. It was 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Orville was caught in a major wildfire. Yeah, so uh, it was called the Wallfire. It was a wildfire here in Northern California. My parents and Mark live on a one of the foothills that are the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and so the fire came down the side of the hill. We saw it coming. It was like a 200 foot fire tornado and they had to get out very fast. Um, I think they had like 20 minutes notice to get out. I know my brother, so I went down to Mark's apartment and I remember, this is this is uh, hard for me, but I remember grabbing just one, one or two trash bags and putting some clothes in there, a couple yearbooks. And I think I grabbed 20 movies. What happened after the evacuation? So I live about five minutes from my parents. I live, they live on um, at the top of a foothill and I live at the bottom. So I actually was sitting on my roof and I saw this huge explosion and I knew it was their house because it was right where their house is located. And that was my childhood home. We'd, been, we'd you know, lived there since I was three years old. And a lot of memories, it was a, a little bit of a difficult time. Well, that, that must have been awful, seeing your home go up in a blink of an eye. We actually had really good attitudes to the whole thing. My parents, Mark, they all were amazing during the whole thing. Um, and I think that's a credit to the fact that my niece at that time was fighting leukemia. So in rec like in comparison to that, it wasn't really a big deal to lose the house um, compared to this little girl fighting for her life. So uh, yeah. So Gunner's a huge movie buff. And uh, this is what I really want to talk about is Mark's movie collection. So Mark's super well known in our community and wherever he goes, people know who he is. He's well loved. I mean, he was raised in this community. He did sports and it was like 400 movies and I couldn't get 400 movies myself. So I thought there was a lot of people reaching out to my family about what they could do for Mark, what they could do for our family. So I just put a post out there and that post got shared like 10,000 times. I think we should get to know Mark. And joining us alongside Danielle, dun dun da, Mark Orsillo. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hi, Kevin. Nice to meet you. We were just speaking to your sister Danielle. She had quite a lot to say about you. Danielle's been on my side every year. Been by your side your whole life, huh? Yes, you have. We've been best friends. Danielle. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got lots of best friends. You have lots of best friends. I thought you only had one. I do. Me. Well, you're a girl. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Mark, how long have you been a fan of movies? A long, long time. I'm 37 years old. So Mark used to get movies all the time when he was younger, and we'd get, he'd open them up on Christmas, and what would you do when you get them on Christmas? I am so happy. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite memory of you though, growing up, is on Christmas morning, you would get one or two movies that were like what you were asking for and you would freak out. What would you do when you got a movie that you wanted? Show them. <laughs> You'd freak out, huh? I freak out all the time. Yeah, every Christmas. Which movies are your favorites? All the Christmas movies. Yeah, because do I love Christmas? <laughs> The one I've been watching all my years. You still have your Christmas lights up. I do. You, I do, I know. <laughs> so you watch Christmas movies all year long? Uh-huh. We love Christmas movies too. Hey Mark, let's go back to when the fire happened, buddy. How scary was that? Did the uh, sheriff have to come and tell you to leave your house? I did. It was Danielle, it was, it was Jacob. They were up there helping us to Evacuate. To evacuate, yeah. It was so hard, it was a wildfire. But now we have money to raise our new house and have a new pool now. <laughs> that pool's pretty cool. I've been swimming a lot. 
Mark, I would have hated to lose my Blu-rays and DVDs too. How many did you have that got lost in the fire? 400 movies. But then you went off the youth camp, right? And while you were gone, Danielle organized the community to donate movies so that when you returned, this happened. I can't find it! Where was it? What is that? I can't even see it. Mark, are you excited? These are, all your, these are all your new videos. And Mark was at youth camp at the time and had no idea. His reaction was pure joy. It was pure, unfiltered joy. You know, sometimes as adults, we like to filter our reactions and filter things. Mark never filters how he's feeling. I'm all happy for all my, all my movie. Because I've been happy, happy all my life. That's the best way to go through life. And it didn't stop there. When Danielle posted the video, it went viral and more people sent you movies, right? Yeah. Yes, the movies kept coming and coming and they just kept sending them in the mail, huh? Yes. Lots of packages. It was a like 400 billion movies. Almost 400 billion. It was more like 14 to 15,000 movies. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Close. <laughs> But we got a lot of movies, didn't we? Yeah, we did. What did we do with the extras? We donated with other people, too. We gave them to other fire victims, huh? Yeah, the people that lost their houses. Yeah. But if, you, if, they were, if all those people that were here, what would you want to say to them about sending your movies? I'd say, I love them. <laughs> Man, that is a miracle. Mark received so many movies from people just out of the kindness of their hearts. But the best part of the story is Mark turns around and he donates them to other people. That act of kindness from so many people around the world just renewed my hope in humanity. I mean, people are good and the love they poured out on me and my family and my brother especially, you know, this, this man who, uh, you know, who's kind of had a difficult time sometimes. They just loved him and they loved him through a really tough time. It just completely restored my hope for humanity, my view of people and their kindness. How did it make you feel your heart? How did it make your heart feel? My heart feels good, actually. I love my life. Thank you both so much for sharing your story. Thank you very much. No, they said thank you to you. Um, he said welcome too. Okay. Films are stories we can use to learn something new about ourselves and the world around us. Now, I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for Mark to lose all of those movies, but after receiving immense support, he was able to share his passion with the world, hopefully allowing people to experience films they would have otherwise missed out on. So now, it's time for the next story. Yeah, there's no stronger bond than one that exists between a parent and a child. It's a bond so strong it can survive time, distance, and seemingly impossible separations. Eddie and Valerie Rivera. They thought they'd never see their daughter after giving her up for adoption. What happened next proved the power of their bonds. We're joined by Eddie and Valerie in Chicago. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Gunnar. Nice to talk to you guys. Hi, it's a pleasure to have you here. So let's start at the beginning. How did you two meet? So I graduated in 88, and there were several schools that came to my high school and were showing different programs um, for the seniors, and one of them that interests me the most was Spartan School of Aeronautics in Oklahoma. I don't know uh, much about aviation, but that's what that school is about, and so I decided to go for it. It was just the most interesting to me at that time. And Eddie, after graduating high school and then taking a year off, you also ended up at Spartan. So what I ended up doing was uh, looking into a, a program that they had at a local uh, hotel um, with the Spartan uh, School of Aeronautics doing their demonstration. And I enjoyed it and I liked it and I decided to uh, go out there. So wait a minute, you're both from Chicago, but it wasn't until you got to Oklahoma when your paths crossed. Yeah, Val about walked into the cafeteria and I noticed her right away. Uh, we were playing pool. She came and talked to somebody that I knew, one of my friends, and they told me that she was from Chicago um, and that's how I started to learn more about her. He, he just said, you know, oh, we're gonna have a get together. So then that's pretty much how we met, uh, just 
kind of went to, we all went to um, him and his roommate's place and just kind of hung out, played games. And after dating for a while, what happened next? So when I found out that I was pregnant, it, it was it was a shock. I really didn't know I was pregnant right away. I just started getting morning sickness and it just a lot of time, I guess, was involved with me discovering that I was pregnant or maybe I was in denial. Eddie and I both were not working. We didn't have jobs. We were really struggling on rent and food. And Eddie and I were driving in his truck and I saw a big billboard and it said, are, are you pregnant? Do you need help? I just knew at that time in my life, I wasn't able to even afford myself, let alone a child. So I, I came to that decision to ultimately give Samantha up. You don't. Um, you know what? Why don't, why don't we give Eddie a few moments? Sorry. As much as I told, as much as I told me I was gonna be strong, it's tough. Hey, I understand that this is too hard for you to talk about. I'll give it a shot. When I found out that she was pregnant, I was, um, I was ecstatic. I was happy, but I was nervous. Um, we were young. It was difficult. Val was a, a strong will, at will person. Um, and there was no making her change her mind. I, I thought that together we would be okay moving forward. Um, but after she had decided to have the adoption, um, there was no changing her mind. So it went from, from excitement to her. I mean, even though you're giving your baby up for adoption, you still wanted her to know that she was loved. I had already decided that I wanted bigger and better for this child. When uh, the uh, person that talked to me, she was just very nurturing and caring and said that she would take care of my medical, uh, prenatal vitamins, uh, apartment and clothes that would fit me because I was of course uh, getting larger from uh, holding the baby. And so she, she did, she took care of all of that and then ultimately at the end is when um, I just knew at that time in my life I wasn't able to even afford myself, let alone a child. So I, I came to that decision to ultimately give Samantha up. So let me make sure this is correct. The two of you weren't married, but you still wanted to keep Samantha's birth a secret from all your family, right? Yeah, personally, I dealt with it very um, internally. I didn't share it with anybody, not a soul. But then you decided after you went back to Chicago that's when you got married. Yes, yeah, so at the time of uh, giving Sam up for adoption, I didn't know that Eddie and I were going to ultimately get married. That was never even a thought or a vision of mine. Um, we were just very young. And then fast forward four years later, uh, we, we ended up getting married and uh, loved that man very much and then we built a life, got a home in the suburbs, um, then had uh, three more beautiful children, Alex, Brianna, and Nico. I imagine this still weighed heavily on both of you. I thought of her even, I thought, of her, I thought about her a lot, but it really touched home when, I, when we had Brianna. My, uh, my second daughter. At this point, we have a fairly standard adoption. And now it's time to meet the person at the center of the story, Samantha Thomas, who joins us all the way from Oklahoma. Hey, welcome there, Sam. Hey, Kevin, I'm Sam Thomas. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on the show. 
Can you tell us about your earliest memories of your parents? I was adopted at two days old, so all my memories from childhood are my adopted parents. And they were always very open about the fact that I was adopted, so. Now we'd like to introduce Sam's adopted parents from Oklahoma, Cindy and Richard. Welcome to the show. Hey Kevin, we're Sam's parents. It's nice to speak with you today. And we're glad you're here. Richard, tell us how you came to adopt Samantha. We had been going through uh, the adoption process for months and months and months and uh, had come across many different adoption agencies, but uh, there was one agency that we had contacted and uh, done an interview with them. And they called us one day and said, would you like a baby girl? They just said, would you like a baby? We had to call back because we said yes, we didn't know if it was a girl or a boy. Sam, did you always know that you were adopted? I think that my parents told me that I was adopted before I could even really comprehend what that meant. Uh, and, and they used things like books, movies, stories, even um, bedtime stories that they made up. It was always inclusive of my biological parents and them and explaining as best they could that I was adopted. It's always a foreign thing to me whenever people ask me, like, are you angry at your birth family? Or were you, did you feel rejected by them? I can't even comprehend having those feelings, but I, I think that was because the way that my adopted parents um, framed my situation and my story from the get-go. Cindy, how much did you know about Samantha prior to the adoption? We didn't know much about Samantha's background. We knew that her birth parents were both from the Chicago area. We knew they were both students. We knew that they were um, had a Mexican Guatemalan background and that they were in their late teens. So you made a decision right from the beginning to let Samantha know that she was adopted. Not just letting her know, but some of the uh, the training, if you will, that we had gone through with this, with the uh, state department, um, uh, told us that you know you can affect this child's uh, well-being and their their own self worth worth by how you treat this, and if you if you do it with love and understanding, then it will be a good thing for them. So we went out of our way thinking that way, thinking. Well, we have to let her know that this, you know, we love her unconditionally and the people that gave her up for adoption, her birth parents, also love her unconditionally and that it was just this circumstance that happened. So, Sam, when did you make the decision to try to track down your birth parents? I really didn't have any curiosity to find them until I was 16 and I went to a youth summer camp up in Colorado and we stayed there for a month and did our jobs. And there was a, a girl that served on that team with me who had just given up a child for adoption and she was 16 or 17, I believe. And I remember trying to go to sleep and hearing her crying. And she, her adoption that had just happened was an open adoption. And so she would receive pictures of her baby that was six months old at the time. And she'd get upset and she'd be, um, you know, she'd be happy, but it was just a very, I, I could see how emotionally torn she was. And I think witnessing, witnessing firsthand what adoption looks like on the other side, that was a huge eye opener for me and, and made me want to find them just to thank them and to just let them know I'm okay. Uh, because I saw what that, what that young mom was going through. And I knew that that was the story for me was that my mom was just very young. So uh, that was kind of, what planted the seed in me to say, you know what, I do, I do want to try. And where did you start? I found out that there was a letter, a photo, and a blanket that my birth family had left for me at the hospital. Uh, and my parents just had forgotten that those, those items were with the attorney. And so come, you know, 10 years later, I was, I was 28. And so I called, I called the attorney and he had just passed away unexpectedly, I believe like six months prior to that. 
And so it was kind of a, a search and rescue mission to find where did his legal paperwork go. And so when we did find it, it, it ended up being transferred to a different attorney's office and they immediately went through and destroyed anything that um, had reached its you know, legal term of how long they had to keep it. And unfortunately, my, my letter and my picture were in that batch of, of paperwork that was destroyed. The only choice we had at that point was to go in front of a judge in the county that I was adopted in and request that my records be open. And that took some doing, but you got the records open. And then what? So once I obtained the original unsealed birth certificate, it was Valerie Lopez was the name on the birth certificates. My adopted parents knew very little about my birth family, but they did know that they were from originally from the Chicago area. So I, I typed in Valerie Lopez, Chicago. And I remember there being hundreds of pages of such a generic name. And, but for whatever reason, I was just drawn to this one name, which was third or fourth on the list, and it said Valerie L. Rivera. I, I basically used that information and went to Facebook and tried to find a correlating, uh, a correlating account. And I found, I found her by the time we got home, which was a two hour drive. So you sent a message, right? And did she respond? It was like 24 hours later that she emailed me back and said, yes, I'm, I'm your mom. And I just sobbed, like I just broke down and sobbed. And so she had left her phone number in that email and told me to text or call anytime. And so I, I texted her immediately and just, I think my first message, I, I just wanted to tell you I'm okay and that I'm, I'm healthy and I'm happy and I hold nothing against you. So after 30 years of giving up her child, Valerie finds out that her child is not only alive, but to reaching out to find her. Valerie, how did it feel when you got that message? I was leaving work and I decided to check my voicemail and it was Samantha. Um, honestly, I waited a, f a couple of days for that to kind of sink in. Um, not that I didn't want to call her, not that I wasn't going to reach out to her. It was just me being afraid of that phone call. So we scheduled a call for the next morning at 9, 9 a.m. And I didn't sleep that night. It was like Chris, you know, it was like Christmas Eve as a child. And so didn't sleep at all. And my husband took my kids out for a walk while I sat on my bed. And I don't, I think we didn't even really know what to say to each other at first. And I got in my car and her and I just talked for hours. I just, I had to absorb her, take her in, get to know her. Um, we cried and just kind of caught her up with everything. Um, it was a lot of crying. It was a lot of just being emotional, a lot of, are you okay? And um, assuring her that I was okay and that I was happy. And, and then found out that my mom and my dad ended up getting married uh, four years after they gave me up, I believe. And they were married for 23 years. And so I had three full siblings, his two brothers and a sister. She told me, all that she had been through, and it was a daily phone call for us. It was crazy, it was like dating, and in the strangest way, dating your mom, it's the, it, that's the only thing I can describe it as, but you would get giddy when you'd see her text messages, and you would wonder how much longer until she was gonna call. It, it, there's just no, there's no words to describe the emotion of, of really getting to hear your birth mom and hear your story and understand where you come from. So now let's jump back over to Eddie. Hey Eddie, so my question to you is, when did you find out that Samantha contacted Valerie? Before she even told me, when I sat down, she didn't even, even let the words out of her mouth because she had somewhat tears. Well, she was fighting tears. And I'm the one that asked her, did she reach out to you? And at first she was, she wouldn't give me any answer and then she couldn't talk and she said, and I just broke down. I immediately texted my sister. That she found us. Mission completed. Now, Sam, you took your time getting to know your birth parents better. Tell us how you finally arranged to travel to Illinois to see them. It was Labor Day weekend um, in early September of 2017 that we flew to them. 
I was excited and nervous. Um, I remember my husband Trent asking me, why are you nervous at this point, right? We've talked for a, for a month and a half and everything's been so positive, but I think there was just that, still that fear of what if I get there and I'm awkward and like I don't have the same sense of humor as them or... Is, is, So the video that you can see is is that moment of me leaving the car door on their driveway and walking up. And I think I was trying to send my kids ahead of time and Trent was like, no, you go. And so I went and as soon as the door opened, my brother and my sister were right there uh, hugging me. And then from there, met, hugged my mom and then hugged my dad. Well, my mom, when she hugged me, she, she squeezed very, very tight and and through her tears were saying, I, I, I don't want to let go. I couldn't stop hugging her. I didn't want to stop. Pure joy. My family was finally together. Um, knowing that the last times my hands had touched her at birth, and then seeing her walking in and gaining my daughter back. Not only did I have my daughter, but I had two grandkids and a son-in-law. I've gained a lot of love and I've gained a whole other family and that doesn't diminish the family I already have. It's just, it gets to add to it. And I'm very lucky that my adopted family sees it the same way. There's no judgment. So uh, she's just, she's just wonderful. She's an angel. I, tr I treasure our relationship. Cindy and Richard, you were both supportive in Samantha's search for her birth parents. Um, so um, I think the hardest part for me was that this was a path that she had to go on by herself and needed to do by herself. Um, and as a parent, that's hard to let them um, walk alone sometimes. Richard, looking back, would you say that your life was enriched by adopting a daughter? Our lives were enriched immeasurably by adopting Samantha. I mean, one thing that I remember is when we were first, when we first went to the hospital and we were going up before we actually saw Samantha, we weren't sure. And the moment we saw her, there was no question Sorry. I personally would love to thank Cindy and Richard for taking such great care of Samantha. I, when I met Cindy for the first time, I brought her an angel, a little gift, because to me, that's what she is to me. She's pure angel. She and Richard together raised Samantha to know that she has two mommies and that we both love her very much. Samantha, what would you say to other adopted children who are thinking about seeking out their birth family? I'm a huge proponent of doing whatever is right for you. I think there's a lot of adoptees out there who, who are too afraid or too anxious or too nervous. And if that's something, or just have flat out have no desire. And I, there's no guilt in that. There should not be any guilt. But if it's something that you are curious about and that you do desire, don't allow the um, don't allow the anxiety to control that because it is such a fulfilling thing. Now that I have Sam, Samantha back in my life, if I could give any advice, it would be to reach out, reach out. I had a hole in my in my heart. She completed. I, I still can't watch that video without crying. It was the purest form of joy and and a story coming full circle as as you can get. Um, it, was, it was a very tender moment. I think it, I just I think that's what it was. It was just it was a full circle full circle moment. 
That's incredible. Yes, and thank you to all for sharing your amazing stories. That's it. I'm Kevin Sizemore. And I'm Gunnar Sizemore. We hope to see you back here next time on The Miracle Show.